Let's get straight into your views on where the markets are at at this um, point in time because it seems that there's some positive momentum that's uh, started to filter through and that on the back of positive sentiment. But some analysts uh, have called for consolidation while we've got others uh, calling for ongoing momentum to these mar markets. Which side of the fence are you sitting on right now? We, uh, we're sitting fairly and squarely right on the fence. Uh, <laughs> we have no idea where markets are going to. Uh, we don't pretend to ever know where markets are going to because markets have a mind of their own. Um, the only thing we can do is to value businesses uh, in relation to their ability to generate cash flows over the long term. Uh, and, and that's all we do all day long. We don't sit and think about where markets are going because you know, you know, we failed miserably at that task, uh, as have many other people. Well, uh, certainly for now, uh, where we've seen the likes of U.S. bond yields rising, it uh, implies that we've got money that's flowing out of U.S. bonds and into equities. So let's take a look on that global scale where you're starting to see value. Well, we, we see value is, um, broadly speaking, in developed markets and not in emerging markets. Uh, and within developed markets, we see fantastic value in Japan, really good value merging in Europe, and some pockets of value still existing in the USA. So it's, that's broadly speaking where we see value. It's very interesting because coming through some commentary uh, with regards to your global feeder fund, I picked up that you say historically you found that low expectations lead to good investment results. So is this what this entire strategy is premised on? That's right. I, I forget who said it, uh, but I heard it first from Tony Mungu who said, uh, you know, anybody, if you want to live a happy life, you should have low expectation. And we, we apply that to investment world as well. So we look for uh, the shares of companies where the market is pricing in very low expectations. And that happens generally when things are tough, when the economic environment is tough. Um, that is when the market starts pricing in long term, low expectations into the prospects of companies. And that is when value investors such as ourselves at RCM start finding bargains. That's what's been happening in Japan over the past five years. You remember, they've been in a 20-year bear market. They've gone from being very expensive 20 years ago to cheap today. Uh, and they only started getting cheap about three or four years ago. And, and they can stay cheap for quite a while still. But the fact is, if you look at Japan today, expectations are low. When you speak to somebody, you tell them you're interested in Japan, they switch off immediately. They, you know, they, they expect Japan to continue suffering from deflation, low earnings growth, and uh, continue to disappoint uh, shareholders. So that's a classic case of low expectations. And in that environment, we're finding some cheap stocks. So, so that's the sort of thing we would look for. Before we delve into the stocks that have uh, caught your attention, I mean, what kind of time horizon are you looking at here? Because like you say, these could stay uh, at these low prices and cheap valuations for a while yet, Pitt. Yes, that's right. So, if one takes a step back, I, I think one of the cornerstones of how we manage money for clients is we are extremely conservative. Our first question is, how much money can we lose? So when we are confronted by a cheap share, if the downside is minimal, we don't care when the upside happens. It could happen next year, two years, five years, seven years. As long as the odds of us losing money is quite low, then we're happy to sit there and wait. Uh, and uh, that's the second thing. Uh, uh, next to low expectations, I think, Patience is a very important tool in the arsenal of successful fund management. So we buy cheap and we patient with those holdings. Uh, we have no idea how long it can take, but it could take five, seven years, and we're happy to wait that long. How do you uh, battle out uh, you know, the p potential missed opportunity that you're looking at in the interim pit? Because, of course, with capital being yes. dedicated down these avenues, you've got less uh, dedicated uh, to avenues where you can leverage faster and quicker growth. That's right. That's exactly right. That's a very good question. And uh, I think it was Pascal, he was a 17th century mathematician. He said, all man's miseries come from not being able to sit alone and quietly in a room. And I think what you mentioned now is exactly what drives Mark in the short term is this fear of missing out. Uh, uh, you know, another word for that is greed. Um, and that is the third thing that we do at RCM is we switch off. We try and ignore that. We ignore those emotions like fear and greed. Uh, so we're not scared of missing out in the short term because we know that if we do the right thing over the long term, the compounding effect of that is very powerful. Uh, so yes, 
we do miss out from time to time, but we quite comfortable missing out. Uh, I think if you are scared of missing out, you are like a cat in a hot tin roof, jumping around from opportunity to opportunity and never really generating substantial long-term returns. Well, uh, looking at the status of things, I mean, you've certainly increased this year uh, compared to last January, your equity exposure by roughly 10%. So let's look at where exactly you're putting uh, your money right now because a very interesting exposure uh, to a company that's listed in Greece, but those are the words to be emphasized here, listed in Greece with operations though yes. in other emerging markets and that Coca-Cola Hellenic bottling. That's right, yeah. Now, Coca-Cola Hellenic Bottling is a very interesting company. Um, it, it bottles Coke, uh, and it has geographic monopolies in interesting markets like Nigeria and Russia and so on, and Greece as well. It happens to be listed in Greece, so it's been subject to the massive selling uh, force that we've seen in Greece equities over the past couple of years, to the extent that it's now priced extremely cheaply. Uh, so by buying this the shares of this company, which happens to be listed in Greece, we're getting, at a very cheap price, exposure to markets like Nigeria and Russia, uh, and a dominant uh, provider consumer goods to these markets, uh, and we think that's a fantastic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, to the extent that it's seen as a Greek company, you know, Coca-Cola Hellenic, that there's some obvious Greek references there, um, it could stay cheap for quite a while because people will not be interested or will be scared of buying assets in Greece. Uh, we think the price, current price compensates you for the risk of Greece leaving the euro and a host of other risks. Uh, so we think the downside is extremely limited and we're prepared to wait for the earnings to come through. Yeah, certainly that uh, interesting and uh, important distinction that's being made when it comes to these companies that are listed in developed companies as well, where yes. you're looking at companies with that exposure to emerging market growth stories. Uh, interestingly enough, you've increased your stake in BP from, uh, what, 3.7% to 4.9%. So take us through some of the rationale there. Of course, that oil price uh, sitting where yeah. it is uh, has got to be one of the factors to consider. Yeah, uh, just a, as an aside, when we value oil companies like BP or Sassol, any of those sort of oil companies, we use what we think is the long-term normalized cost of production, which is around, for us currently, about $85 per barrel. So we're not using current oil prices, and we know we have no idea where the oil price is going, whether yeah. it's going up or down, we just don't know. We're just using uh, you know, the marginal cost of production, which uh, is sitting uh, much lower than today's price. But in any case, so getting back to BP, uh, we think it's probably uh, the cheapest oil business in the world. Um, historically, oil businesses have been fantastic business. As economies grow globally, they become more and more energy intensive. And of course, the beneficiaries of those are the guys who produce energy in the form of oil like BP, oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Now, BP originally became very cheap after the disaster in the Gulf. That's when we initially bought our stake. Then there was a bit of relief after the settlement, uh, and it became clear that settlement would be a lot less than the market was expecting initially. Share price ran up, uh, and then just recently, um, it came back down again over the past six months or so, and uh, that's when we added that exposure at, at low levels again. So uh, it's, uh, <coughs> it's, it's something we look for at RECM. It, it is a good quality business that gets cheap for uh, what we believe is temporary reasons and then we like to buy a big stake uh, in the fund of a company like that and then just sort of sit on it for a while. Yeah. Uh, so good quality with low expectations priced into, in other words, cheap, that's, that's a classic situation that we look for. Just before we let you go, uh, in the retail segment, it seems that you've swapped, up, uh, swapped out your, share, uh, your stake in Walmart uh, stores uh, to uh, exposure via uh, Family Mart and Carrefour, which is a uh, French retailer as well. So take us through the, right. the rationale there. <coughs> Okay, um, the family bond position uh, we've had for quite a while. Um, it's a convenience store operator in Japan, and there's a bit of that in Southeast Asia. It owns some shops in Southeast Asia as well. Um, very, very cheap uh, compared to any other store operator in the world. So, so that's one thing. But what we did do is we sold our Walmart, which had done very well for us, um, uh, but bought into Carrefour, which, as you said, is a French retailer. And uh, retailers in Europe, and specifically in France, and specifically in the hypermarket segment, which Carrefour dominates, mm -hmm. have struggled. Um, and uh, currently, it is priced at very low levels because of its struggle over the past two, three years. 
and because of the current economic turmoil in Europe. Now, that turmoil might last a while longer, but we think uh, at some point in the next 10 years, it turns around again. And in the meantime, Carrefour has a very nice uh, portfolio of properties. And, um, you know, it is still in the retail business. And you're getting a re retail business extremely cheaply, cheaply if you back out the property side of, of the business. So um, under current conditions, the market is very negative. It has low expectations for Carrefour. And again, those are the sort of things that attract us and uh, cause us to buy shares in it. So at this point, Pitt, then no exposure to Walmart right now? No, we've re I think we've reduced the exposure to Walmart to, if it isn't zero, it's, it's very low and uh, is on its way to zero. It's very interesting because it's at a time when Walmart is building up its strategy on the African continent pit. I mean, uh, you, yes. you know, what do you make of that move uh, by Walmart to uh, venture into Africa and the opportunity there? Look, I think a lot of companies are moving to Africa today. Um, we think to buy assets in Africa today is very expensive. We think Walmart overpaid for uh, its stake in MassMart. But in the bigger scheme of things, in, in Walmart's life, it is a small exposure. So it's neither here nor there in our valuation of Walmart mm -hmm. uh, itself. Uh, what's happened to Walmart is moved from uh, below $40 to the high $50. So it's gone up by almost 50% over the past few years. And that's just uh, reduced the margin of safety in, in, the, in holding shares in that company. And that's what causes us to sell it. Uh, we're not selling it on a view of overpaying for assets in Africa because it really is still a very small portion of its life. Yeah. Well, let's leave it there, Pit. Thanks so much for your insights this afternoon. Pit Villian is Executive Chairman at ReCM. Thank you.